you're just joining us on Sunday night and haven't been with us, uh, uh, we're in a series on Sunday night, What the Bible Says. And we're covering subjects all the way from A to Z. And we're dealing with some uh, touchy subjects along the way. And we're dealing with some subjects that are really so far beyond uh, one session or one evening to deal with, but we want to take time with to deal with it. But if you've not been a part of our Sunday night, let me encourage you to do so. Uh, and let me say this, and I want to give a, a big hand to our sound team. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but all of our services are on YouTube. Uh, I think there's better than three or four hundred of our services on, on YouTube. And when I was looking up the analytics on uh, YouTube, now that means who, where people are. Do you realize we have people watching in Hong Kong? We have people watching in Italy. Uh, we have people watching in Belgium. And we've had people watching in Brazil. And I think that is through this past month. So you don't ever know where this is going. Uh, also, there's people in the United States, too, that's, uh, that's watching. But it's just amazing how God uses this. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, God has used it. One sister church has used it as a means of listening to a preacher and, and uh, possibly maybe calling a preacher to come to their fellowship. But tonight we're going to look at what does the Bible say about Jesus. We've been going A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and, and I've dealt with what does the Bible say about uh, uh, so many subjects. But tonight I want to look at what does the Bible say about Jesus. Now, we can take an entire lifetime and lifetime and lifetimes and never exhaust the subject of what the Bible says about Jesus. Who is this Jesus that we worship? You stop and think about it. You come together. And we sing the songs of Jesus. We are saved in the name of Jesus. But whenever somebody asks you, if somebody would ask you, who is this Jesus, what would you say? Now, part of this is designed to, to help us as Christians to sort of better able to formulate in a, in a nutshell, if somebody says, well, who do you believe Jesus is? Now, let me give you a little bit of backdrop before I get into the passage of Scripture tonight. Do you realize that the early church really struggled with trying to understand who this Jesus was? It was around 340, 350 A.D., the Council of Chalcedon, where they really nailed down that Jesus Christ was one of the Trinity because here's what their thinking was. You have God the Father, that's one. You have God the Son, that would be two. And the Bible says, how many lords are there? How many God? There is one God. So they're trying to figure out in those early days, what do we do with Jesus? How do we, how do we explain? How do we understand? Now, you and I know from Scripture it's very simple, but some of the early church fathers were really having a struggle trying to, because here you have God the Father, you have God the Son, you have God the Holy Spirit, you have a trinity. Now, try to find the word trinity in the Bible, and it's simply not there. But uh, someone said, you try to explain the trinity, and you'll, you'll lose your mind. But you try to explain it away and you'll lose your soul. And there's a great deal of truth in that. But tonight I want to deal in just capsule form. What does the Bible say about Jesus? Who is this Jesus? Because, as a matter of fact, Jesus made it very clear. There are going to be others who are going to come in his name. There are going to be false messiahs and false Christ and false prophets. But what does the Bible say about the Jesus that you and I serve? So uh, if you'll take your Bible and follow along, and I'm going to be looking at different passages of Scripture, and you'll see it on the overhead as well. First of all, I want you to look at John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I want you to follow along in the Living Bible too. Before anything else existed, there was Christ with God. So what does the Bible have to say about who is, our, who is this Jesus? Well, first of all, you and I need to understand this Jesus is God. Now, Jesus is not half God and half man. And I'll explain that in just a moment. He is not 40% man, 60% God. He is 100% God, 100% man. As a matter of fact, in uh, Colossians, in chapter 2, verse 9, for in him, God through Paul is writing in him, talking about Jesus Christ, dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, to say it in a little simpler way, in Jesus is the fullness of God in body form. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. He said to them, Who do you say that I am? 
Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, it's important to understand that Jesus is God. And here's a number of reasons why. First of all, when Jesus Christ would go to the cross and would die on the cross and give himself on the cross, if Jesus Christ was not, is not God, then you and I are in a world of mess. Why? Because you have a man dying on the cross. You have a man dying in his sins. If he's not the Christ, he's a liar. I like the way Josh McDowell put it. And if you've ever not ever read his book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, you need to uh, get it. You need to get a copy of it. And he wrote a sequel to it, More Evidence That Demands a Verdict. But he said, if he is not Lord, then there's only two other things. He is a liar. Now think about it for a moment. Jesus himself claimed to be God. Jesus himself said, no one comes to the Father but by me. If Jesus Christ is not who he says he is, there's only two other, only two other rational answers. Either he is a liar. In other words, he is intentionally deceiving people to get people to believe he is someone that he is not. And that, by definition, is a liar. And, uh, or he could be a lunatic. You see, there are some people who believe themselves to be somebody that they're not. There are some people who believe uh, they're the president, outside of the president. There are some people who believe they're a prophet, and they, but they, they're self-deceived. In other words, there's something wrong with their mental capacities. And there's only two answers other than the reality of him being Lord. Either he is God, he is who he says he is, or he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. And it's important that Jesus is God for the simple reason that, you know, in Him is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. In other words, if He is not who He says He is, then you and I don't have what we say we've got. Did you hear me say that? If He is not who He says He is, you don't have what you think you've got. You're not going to go to heaven at death. You're going to go to hell. If He is not God, you're going to be banished and you're going to live in eternal damnation because nobody took your sin. You see, do you realize every single sin you commit is an eternal sin against an eternal God? Sometimes we'll say, well, now what's wrong with a little white lie? Because it's a sin and every sin is eternal. That's why every person who is going to hell, they're going to go there for all of eternity because every sin has eternal consequences because every sin is eternal. There's no payment in 25 years for your sin. There's no payment in 100 years or... 500 years or a thousand years and then you get out and go to heaven and so you know Jesus was God at two months now here's something that's very challenging to understand I don't you can't understand it it's simply the truth but it's hard to he was God at two months he was God at 11 he was God at 14 he was God at 20 he was God at 22 he was God at 30 now explain that to me you see here's the reality if God fits into my human thinking, then he's not really God, is he? Don't you and I need a God that we cannot comprehend, understand, or fathom? If you and I have a God that we can understand and fathom and figure out, then he is no greater than the greatest mind that can figure him out. And that's exactly, our, our God is not that God. That's what Jesus made it very clear. As a matter of fact, you know, he had two natures running concurrent in his body simultaneously all the time. So what do you mean, Pastor? He lived completely in a human body. In other words, if you, if you uh, uh, smacked him, he hurt. You know, I mean, Jesus was not given. There's this idea, and it came from Plato hundreds and hundreds of years ago, that uh, somehow that, you know, all physical body is bad, and therefore Jesus couldn't have a physical body. And there was some in that day and time that said, well, Jesus couldn't have a physical body because everything physical is bad. Well... That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says he became flesh and dwelled among us. What does it mean? He has every human emotion that you and I have. He has every sensing that you and I do. He has uh, two natures. He has a human nature running through his body. He knew what it was when he went to the tomb of Lazarus. And the Bible says he looked at the tomb of Lazarus. And the Bible says he wept. By the way, do you ever wonder why Jesus wept? Carl's raising his head. I believe you're right. 
Listen, you say, well, he's sad because he's dead. No, because you've got resurrection standing right there. You see, you stop and think about it a moment. How many funerals did Jesus ever go to? You see, when Jesus shows up, there's no more funeral. You ever stop and think about that? When Jesus, that's why when the Lord descends from heaven with a shout, as we're studying on Wednesday night, with the trump of God the, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And uh, somebody said the dead in Christ will rise first because we who are alive, they've got six more feet to go than we do. Now, but, but here's, the whole, here's the whole point. Here is the Son of God, two natures running concurrent in His body simultaneously all of the time. You say, I don't understand that. You don't have to. You see, one of our faults as human beings is this. It's called the law of sense making. In other words, we want to make sense of everything. I got to tell you a secret. Don't tell Charlotte about this, okay? I snuck out of the house yesterday. Man, have you ever snuck out of the house? We had a tremendous problem at our house. I don't know if you ever had this. We were out of biscuits. We were out of good biscuits to fix for Sunday morning. And uh, I said, I'll go get, no, you don't go get none. And here's what I knew. Just as soon as I told her that I would, uh, I would leave, she would say something about it. Well, what did I do? I just got in my car. And, and uh, about five, ten minutes later, I said, uh, you need anything else from the store? <laughs> she said, where are you? Uh, and uh, because there's that law in us, the law of sense making. One of the things we try to do, we try to make sense of everything. Notice sometimes. And it really is a... a and, and so he, how, how do you make sense of it? Here is one person. He has two natures running concurrent in his body simultaneously all the time. I cannot comprehend it because he's God, I'm not. And that's exactly what, as a matter of fact, those outside of the Christian culture in that day and time. You remember what the soldier said? Surely this was the Son of God. Now, why is that so important? Because those outside of belief believed Jesus was God and they were the eyewitnesses in that moment. And you see, that's so important because if Jesus is not God, if He is not the Son of God, if He is not God in the flesh, then you and I are doomed, damned, and definitely on our way to hell. But Jesus is God in the flesh. And He took away your sin. Why? Because He took on all the wrath of the Father. And so, in Matthew 16, as I just read, He said to them, But who do you say that I am? In other words, Jesus said, I want you to tell me, who do you... Now, Jesus is not asking that for any information. He already knew. What do you say that I am? You say, listen very carefully. What you say about Jesus doesn't alter Jesus one iota. But it will alter you. If you believe Jesus is just a good man, and he's just a, a nice person, and he's just a good uh, prophet, well, if, he's, if, if that's all that he is, then there's not a single solitary believer in the universe because there's nobody going to heaven. And that's why he had to be God in the flesh because only God could take our sin upon him and be the holy, pure, and perfect sacrifice before a holy God. So the Bible says, first of all, Jesus is God. And that's why you and I need to, you don't ever need to bounce around on that. He is God. He is God in the flesh. Eyewitnesses who were believers and those who were not believers knew Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Now, the further along you move from from that day and time, people question. But aren't you glad whenever you bow your head and you go to the Lord, you have somebody that can hear and answer your prayer? You have somebody that is there. He's not somebody, you know, abstract. He's not somebody who's a figment of your imagination. He is the sovereign, holy, almighty God. As a matter of fact, Jesus said this, I and my Father are what? One. And He said, no one comes to the Father, but by the you don't go to heaven without Jesus Christ. You don't go to heaven by Buddha, by Muslim. You say, well, Pastor, that's pretty narrow-minded. Yes, it is, because I'm right. There is no other way unto heaven but by Jesus Christ. He said anyone else is like a thief and a robber. And so, first of all, the Bible says Jesus is God. Second of all, the Bible says that Jesus was totally human. Listen to John 1, 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. 
And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Watch this. Full of grace and truth. Now listen very carefully. Sometimes we read the Bible so fast that we don't absorb it. But go back and I want you to listen to that verse. And I want you to listen to it very carefully. I'm going to go back. And the word, referring to Jesus, became flesh. And dwelled among us. In other words, he, he lived among us. He tabernacled among us. He, he knew what it was. He knew what it was to have a hard day's work. He knew what it was for his character to be assassinated. He knew what it was to be rejected. He knew what it was to be ridiculed. And see, sometimes we'll say something like, oh, if the Lord only knew. You ever heard somebody say, if the Lord, he does know. Listen, do you ever stop and think about Jesus knew the day, the month, the hour, the moment he was going to die? Now, let's suppose that God in his infinite wisdom and genius, he can say, I want to let every one of you know, I'm going to tell you, if you'll let me, I'll tell you the day, the month, the hour, the year that you're going to die, and I'll get it on a piece of paper, and I'll, or I'll, I'll, better still, I'll mail it to you, and it'll arrive this week. How many of you would want to know it? But listen to what Jesus would, he'd say, cheer up. He knew how he was going to die, when he was going to die, the way he was, he never was anxious, he never was excited, he never was nervous. Why? Because he came to do the will of the Father. But I want you to understand he had a nature of flesh. That didn't mean that he sinned. But that meant that he could identify. He knows exactly what your life is like and my life is like. He knows exactly what we struggle with. He knows exactly what it is to be lonely and rejected. I was talking to someone before church. And God knows who they are. You pray for person X. But they said, I'm very lonely, I'm very depressed, I'm just sitting looking at four walls. When I hear somebody say that, it concerns me. But God knows that he had a human nature. He had a human nature like you and like me. The disciples watched his humanity. They watched him eat. Those who persecuted him, they watched his back as his body broke open with blood. You see, the reality of it is... He identifies. I love what Hebrews said. We don't have a high priest that doesn't know our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. But I love the next phrase, don't you, without sin. He knows what we face. He knows our infirmities. And the Word became flesh. Watch this. But He was filled with grace and truth. In other words, Jesus never went around wanting His own rights. His life was filled with grace and mercy and kindness and gentleness. You know why? Because he was of the Father. He had two natures running concurrent. And there was nothing in this world that he would want outside of you and me to be redeemed and forgiven of our sins. And so he knew what it was like to have friends die. He knew what it was to mourn and to grieve and to, and to cry. And the Bible says, number three, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I want you to notice something. In John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, in John's gospel, Jesus uttered six I am statements, and this is one of the I, the I am statements. Here's what Jesus is announcing in this verse. He said, I want you to understand, not only am I God, not only am I human, but I want you to understand that I am the way. What do you mean the way? I am the only way to heaven. I am the only way to paradise. I am the only way to forgiveness of your sins. You see, here's the thing about it. We've got a lot of self-help programs in our day and time, and I don't put them down, but I can tell you that the good is the enemy of the best. Amen? And the truth about it is we can go through a whole lot of self-help programs but there's something about getting on your knees and asking the Lord Jesus Christ to cleanse you and forgive you and wash you clean. He does something that all the psychologists in the universe cannot do and are unable to do. Why? Because Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. In other words, Jesus never just tells truth. Listen carefully. Jesus just never tells truth. Jesus is truth. There is nothing but truth that is inside the person of Jesus Christ. That's why whenever you're reading the Bible, you're reading the truth from cover to cover. You're reading what God says. You're reading what God says about himself, about this world, about you and me, 
about Satan, about a future, in, either in heaven or in hell. And you see, some people say, well, I just, I just don't know if I believe it. I'm sorry, that doesn't change the truth. And so Jesus made it very clear. He said, I am the way to the Father. As a matter of fact, he made it so plain. He said, no man. You know, the gospel is so simple, isn't it? And so many people have complicated it up. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. In other words, unless you repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ. Well, can I place my faith in Jesus Christ plus works and then go to heaven? No. It's not by grace are you saved through faith plus works, is it? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, 9, and 10. Verse 8 and 9, rather. For by grace are you saved through what? Faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works of righteousness, lest any man should boast. And so Jesus is announcing, I am the way to the Father. You see, there's some things in life, you get them wrong, there's not a big problem. You can correct them. But have you ever got on the wrong road going someplace and you found out that you're on the wrong way? There's nothing so humbling. And uh, I was going to my brother's who lives in Arkansas. And we stopped off at a gas station. We got us something to eat, filled up. And I got back on and I got disoriented and turned around and I got on the interstate and I was making a good time. I mean, I was going to get there if I'd been aimed in the right direction. I wasn't going south or going west. I was going south. I was going toward Bentonville, Arkansas. Now, Here's the problem. I was on the road. The road was a good road. Matter of fact, it was better than the one going to his house. I was making wonderful time, but I was going the wrong way. And the reality of it is, that's exactly what happens so many times with so many individuals. They're going the wrong way. They're using the wrong road map. They're going the wrong place. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And now there's one exclusive way to the Father. That's why, you know, that's why we're concerned about who do we have to teach? Who do we have to preach? What do we have, you know, what do people declare? Because it's important. It's absolutely important what we hear and what God says through His Word. Now, you say, well, well what about uh, people who are Hindu, people who are Muslim? Can I sum up every religion in just a simple nutshell? Every religion, with the exception of Christianity, you've got to do something to go to heaven according to them. You've got to do something. Every religion, bar none, whether it's Hindu, Shintoism, uh, Confucianism, Muslim, whatever it is, listen, there is one reality in the Christian faith you do nothing to be saved except trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ that was given at the cross 2,000 years ago. And the sad part about it is so many people, after they leave this life, they'll find themselves banished out of the presence of God. Why? Because they've gone another way. Well, second of all, or number four, the Bible says that Jesus is our sin bearer. Oh, I love this one. I want you to look at John 3, 16. Now, you know that. You can say it, but there's something about looking at it. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, you are born this way. You came in this world with a sin nature. Now, you say, well, a baby don't sin. Well, reality, yes, they do. You say, now, wait, are you saying a three-year-old baby sins? Yes. They're not accountable for their sin. How many of you have watched a two- or three-year-old baby lie before they talk? They want something, and they know how to cry for it. Or they steal before they walk. You look around and where did it go to? Where's my good ink pen? Who got my good ink? And all of a sudden, you, they got it behind their back or something. And, and, here, and here's the point. Scripture makes it very clear. In Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, 
He became your sin. Now I want you to try to listen as carefully as you can. You are filled with wickedness and unrighteousness. That simply is the way that it is. All of us are. There is no exception. But I love what the Bible makes very clear. In 1 Corinthians or 15, 3 and 4, watch this. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day according to the Scripture. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For He, referring to God, For He, God the Father, made Him who knew no sin. Watch this. Look at the words. Look at the word. For He made Him to, who knew no sin to what? To be sin. All of your will, your wickedness, your filth, your ungodliness, every bad thing you've ever thought, ever would think, or ever will think, every ungodly action, thought, deed, motivation, the Bible says God made Jesus sin. In other words, that's why he had to be God, because only God could handle the sin debt of the world. Now, folks, it's the most horrible picture. That's why we... That's why the crucifixion is so horrible. God is pouring out his entire wrath on sin. You remember some years ago, we went to see the movie uh, Mel Gibson. Was it Passion of the Christ? And you looked at him, and I've heard some people, some of you have shared with me, said, I don't want to see that movie again. Not because you don't like the movie and you don't like what it depicts, but you don't want to see the the hurt and the agony. Do you realize in a fury and the wrath, in the majestic, holy wrath of God, God the Father, through all of His wrath upon God the Son, who was sin for you and for me, and in that one cataclysmic moment, God the Son became your sin, and God executed Jesus Christ And in executing Jesus Christ, He executed your sin at the cross. Amen? Think about it. So why do you carry your sin? So many people feel guilty and live in guilt and are bombarded with guilt. Listen, your guilt was taken when Jesus died. 1 John 3, 5 says, And you know that He was manifested, or He was made known, To take away our sins. And in Him, there is no sin. So the Bible makes very clear. Listen, if you live a negative, defeated, unhappy life, that's not God's fault. You see, it's sort of like, let's say somebody came up to you and they said, I'm going to pay your bills the rest of your life. There's three people smiling at that. I'm going to pay your bills the rest of your life. Now, I don't think we've got a power problem. I think that's designed so you can see the overhead a little. But you know some people would say, no, you're not going to pay my bills. I'm going to go to work and I'm going to work hard. I'm not letting anybody pay my bills. And then there'd be those few people say, well, yeah, I will let you pay my bills. Hallelujah. Thank you. Listen carefully. Do you realize he became all of your sin for all of your life, for all of eternity, so that you could be free and have life that God purposed? That's exactly what God desired. He became sin for us who knew no sin. And that's exactly what the Bible says. And the reason we could go to heaven, the reason we can laugh and have joy, it's not because our sins are not that bad, but they've been paid for by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Your sins are not going to be paid for. God's not going to think about paying for your sins. They have already been paid for in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's what God has already said. That's what has happened. So the Bible says that Jesus is our sin. And one of the passages of Scripture says it this way, and I love this. It's as though God took all of your wickedness and put into Him and poured all of His righteousness and put into you. What an exchange. What an exchange. That's exactly what happened. He became your sin bearer. And then number five, the Bible says Jesus is our intercessor. Hebrews 7, 25, 
Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost. They come into God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. You know, the glorious truth that we are saved is this. Now, why don't you listen? You cannot lose what God has given to you. Aren't you glad about that? Let's suppose you have a bad day tomorrow. You have a horrible day. You have a rotten day. And you do some things that you ought not do. Say some things that you ought not say. Listen to what God says. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. In other words, God said, I announce to you that you are saved, that you're redeemed, that you're a child of God. And so that's exactly what God makes very clear. And, uh, you know, Christ lived on the earth as a perfect God-man. And he intercedes for you and me. He's the go-between. You see, you can't face anything in life but what Jesus already knows it. He's already experienced it. He's already walked through it. Think about it for just a moment. When you pray, the Bible says he's the intercessor. What have you walked through that Jesus hasn't faced? And the wonderful thing about it is he loves to listen to us. You ever remember the time when your children, grandchildren were little and, and they got it all wrong whenever they were saying something? When Stephanie was little, she would say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only forgotten son. I still remember that. And I, I like that because there's a lot of truth in that. And you love to hear your children with all their mistakes and all that. Why? Because that's what makes life so enjoyable. And, you know, the Bible says he's our intercessor. He's our go-between. He goes to the Father in our behalf. And God hears and answers our prayers because you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now listen carefully. How many of you have ever said, Lord... I really don't feel like you're listening to me. I, I just don't feel like you're listening to my prayer. I want to go back and I want to replay what I just said real slowly. Lord, I don't, what's the next word? Feel. F-E-E-L. Let me show you how temperamental that is. How many of you wives really feel deeply loved right now by your husband? Don't you dare answer that out loud. How many husbands feel deeply loved Feelings are, are fragile things. They come and go. And, and the truth about it is, listen, the Bible makes it very clear. He's our intercessor. Your sins have been forgiven. He's our intercessor. He's, and you never have to feel belittled and demeaned, degraded. Lord, I come to you because my sins have been forgiven. I come to you because you are God. I come to you, Lord Jesus, because you were fully human. I come to you because you're my intercessor. And I just lay open my heart to you. It's wonderful. Listen, he's not up in heaven saying, all right, now you didn't pray in the King James Version. And you've heard me tell you that story before. When I was a kid, I, I thought, Lord, if I prayed in something other, and I, please don't misunderstand, I didn't mean that. But I thought you had to pray in a certain language. He loves us. He loves to intercede. He loves to listen to us. He loves to answer our prayer. There's something special when we talk to our children, they love to listen to us. Number six, the Bible says Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Oh, I love this. Listen to what John says in 11, 25 and 26. Jesus is speaking. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, watch this, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Now, folks, on this day, I love this verse, don't you? When you think about what has happened in Sutherland, Texas, and people who have been executed, they've been martyred, and they've been shot down. But listen to what our Lord says. And you and I know this. I will lay this body down, and you will too if you live long enough, but I can't die. It is an absolute impossibility for a born-again believer to die. Now, your spirit will be released and go back to be with the Lord in heaven. This body will go back to the grave, but you're not going to die. Someday, the Bible says, the resurrection. Who is the resurrection? Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Jesus said, I am the resurrection. I love the way that it's worded. Jesus didn't say, I will be the resurrection. I might be the resurrection. Someday, I'll be the resurrection. He says, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection. I am life. If you believe in me, though you die, in other words, Jesus said, 
it by chance your, your life is shortened and you do die and you die of natural causes or unnatural causes, whatever it is, you're going to live again. You're going to get up. Why? Because he is the resurrection. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, I'm the resurrection, I'm the door. And you see the wonderful reality about it, we have resurrection life on the inside of us right now. Listen carefully. You are not going to have resurrection life. If you have Jesus Christ on the inside of your life right now, you have resurrection. Did you hear that? Listen carefully again, one more time. If you have Jesus Christ living on the inside, you have resurrection, which is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and therefore, somebody, now we don't want to die, nobody wants to die, you know, but when you get to the point that you know that you can't live any longer, I think some people even desire to die, maybe even pray to die. But Jesus said, I want you to understand, he was speaking to Lazarus' sister, whoever lives and believes in me, he'll never die. Now I want you to know the son. Look at the verse. Jesus spoke in such absolute ways that either he's a liar, lunatic, or he is who he says he is. Aren't you glad he is who he says he is? And he said, do you believe this? And of course, you know what happened next. Jesus spoke. Lazarus, come forth. Do you know the saddest person that day? Who is the saddest person that day? Lazarus. Can't you just imagine he's in glory, he's enjoying? I think I hear the Lord Jesus. But he's on the earth. I'm here in glory. Lazarus, come forth. You see, Lazarus' body was in the tomb. Lazarus was in glory. I don't know, the Bible don't say this. But here's Lazarus leaving glory, coming back into a body, coming back out to his family. Now, let me ask you a real sobering question you need to think about. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, right? Lazarus died once. Did Lazarus die a second time? I'll leave that there with you. But here's what Jesus said. He said, I'm the resurrection. I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. And, that, and that's why you and I need to live in hope. That's why we hate things like what happened in Sutherland, Texas, but thank God our brothers and sisters that are redeemed, they're in glory tonight and they're praising God and worshiping God and singing the praises of God. Yes, their bodies are there, but they're released and they're in heaven. And if that happened here, God for help that it not. But if that happened, aren't you glad we know where we're going and we know what we're going to have and experience? Why? Because of our Lord, our Jesus said, I am the resurrection and life. And then lastly, but Jesus is also the ultimate judge. You know, right now in this life, we have the joy of placing our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and walking with Him and following Him and listening to what He has to say to us through His Word and, and just, just being His followers. But someday, He's going to be the judge of every single man, woman, boy, and girl that has ever lived, is living, or will ever live. The Bible says in John 5, 22, for the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. In other words, someday, at the direction of the Lord Jesus, at the direction of God the Father, let's suppose it's the rapture. Now, if the rapture took place tonight, if you're an unbeliever, you'd be sitting right here and you'd notice the rest of us were gone. If you're an unbeliever and you're without Jesus Christ, let me tell you something that's going to happen. Someday this world is going to notice there's going to be massive amounts of Christians that are going to vanish in less than one second. You say, how do you know that? Because God says it. It's going to happen. God through Paul, I, this is by the word of the Lord, is what Paul says. But what it says in this text. And so someday you're going to stand in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says someday every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, some will to eternal glory and to worship and to majesty, some to their eternal damnation. 
Adolf Hitler is going to bow the knee and say, Jesus is Lord. Stalin is going to bow the knee. Lenin is going to bow the knee. Mussolini is going to bow the knee. Napoleon is going to bow the knee. Whoever has lived is living. Son to eternal life and son to eternal damnation. You see, for you and for me, you have this life to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But after this life is over, that's it. There is no second chance to be saved. There's no second chance to go to heaven. I never will forget reading a story. A man came into church. And the preacher was preaching in a revival service. This is a true story. And the preacher felt compelled to go back and talk to that young man about his soul's salvation. And he said, preacher, now listen carefully. What He said, you can bray like a donkey all you want to. I just came here to pick me up a girl. Judgment came upon that man's life in a very short period of time. He got out of his car, got in it, started it up, went up around the corner, and he ran head on into a vehicle, and he was killed instantly. There is a point of no return. You heard me mention this morning the life that God can't use. There is also a life that just, some would say, sent away their day of grace. So what do you mean by that? They just rebel and rebel and rebel and rebel and won't place their faith in God, won't place their faith in Jesus Christ. Just simply say, you know what? I don't want it. Now listen carefully, friend. Every one of us. God makes it very clear. Verse 22, the Father judges no man. But someday, you'll be judged by Jesus Christ. If you're redeemed, your eternal assignments are going to be determined by what you've done with your life. But if you're, if you're not redeemed, if you don't have the shed blood of Jesus Christ applied to you, your degree of damnation and eternal hell will be determined by the Lord Jesus. Can you imagine? I cannot fathom tonight. If we could open up, we'd see hell wide open and we'd see people weeping and moaning and crying because they refuse to accept the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You say, oh man, if they could come back to life, if they could hear the gospel again, they'd be saved. No, they wouldn't. Now I want to say something very sober. There's not a person in hell that if they were given another chance, they'd be saved. They've chosen to reject the gospel They've chosen to reject Jesus Christ and they're receiving the fruit of their rejection. Someday the Lord's going to be my judge. He's going to be your judge. And your, the, your life's going to be... You're not going to get away from, with anything. Nobody's getting away. And someday, if you've been faithful and obedient and honored the Lord Jesus Christ, you have an eternity of an assignment. He's going to give it to you. But some, they don't have anything but doom and damnation. Revelation, the last chapter next to the last chapter, God makes it very clear those that were not written in the Lamb's book of life. Aren't you glad that through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and what he did at the cross, aren't you glad your name's written in the Lamb's book of life? 